full bacteria on the skin. It has to be there. Um, <clears throat> when we get an opening into the skin, um, it can become, that normal bacteria on the skin can become a problem. It can be more of a um, opportunistic type of a thing. And then our body reacts to that and we get that inflammatory response to it. You can have primary bacterial infections of the skin and secondary bacterial infections of the skin. Alright, primary is going to be when the, the primary problem is that infection. Alright, you've got impetiga, you've got erysipelas, furunculosis, or a furuncle. We're going to talk about what these things are. Secondary infection is when you've got the primary problem is eczema. Okay, you've got a plaque of eczema and then because of chronic scratching and you, you just have uh, compromised skin and that skin barrier, that's when that normal bacteria on the skin can cause a problem, can overgrow and, and cause a problem. With the primary, it tends to be more a single bacteria when a secondary, it tends to be uh, more than a mixture of organisms. <clears throat> so the main two bugs that cause problems with bacterial infections of the skin are Staph aureus and Group A strep. All right. So let's talk about impetigo. I'm sure have you. I know you've heard of impetigo, haven't you? Yeah. <clears throat> so impetigo is a bacterial infection of the skin. It's very, very common. It's very, very contagious. You tend to see it more in kiddos or probably older teenagers that are in contact sports. You can have bolus. What does bolus mean? What's a bolla? A large blister. Yeah. A you, so a form of impetigo can form blisters. The large majority of it doesn't form blisters though. This is limited to the upper part of the skin, so it's not going to scar. People are always worried about scarring. Is this going to leave a scar? This is not going to leave a scar because it's not going deep enough. All right, now it can, anytime we get inflammation in the skin, it can cause pigment changes, lighter or darker, but that's temporary. That will go back to normal. That is not true scarring. <clears throat> and it can be caused by either or, staph aureus or group A strep. Okay, I was reading this last night going through it, and I'm like, what the heck were you doing? <laughs> Okay, so the non-bolus does not have blisters, okay? Uh, it's mainly just that honey-colored crusting. Plaques or, or papules of redness with honey-colored crusting. The bolus, you may see blisters or the blisters may have already ruptured. And then you have redness or erythema and honey-colored crusting. It seems like... Just again, just from working in the area, it seems like with the bolus, the, the non-bolus tends to have like uh, the crust, the honey colored crust is more prominent. With the, the bolus impetigo, you have crusting, but it doesn't seem to be as prominent and it tends to be a little bit more on the outer edge, if that helps at all. So kind of, um, I don't know what I was saying there with that. So this is your typical non-bolus impetigo. Redness, red erythematous papules, plaques with honey color crusting. Okay, that is the terminology you want to use. This is bolus impetigo. Okay, you can see some blisters, some bullae, um, but some have ruptured. And again, you don't see quite as much uh, crusting. And it seems like that tends to be the case. You may see some, but it's not as prominent. But you can tell that blisters have been there. 
you know what I mean? Like on the, the buttocks. You can tell those are blisters that have since popped and they're red and there's a little bit of crusting <coughs> in there. Honey colored crusting, if you could see close. I mean, you can do a bacterial swab and bacterial <coughs> cultures and things like that, but you typically don't need to do that. We know what what causes this. If you are suspicious for it, treat it. Okay, don't don't spend extra money to to do a million dollar workup. To treat this, I'm usually going to use a topical alone. I'll use an antibac have them use an antibacterial wash of some sort. Dial is a, just an over-the-counter antibacterial wash. And then they'll apply a topical antibiotic. I would not use over-the-counter Neosporin. I would use prescription Bacterban or Mupiracin. And then there's a newer one called Altabax. I may have made a mistake with that. Altabax, again, I'm not, I, uh, Dr. Latassi may ask you um, appropriate dosing. I'm not going to try to get you on that, okay? So if I have a dosing, I'm not trying to trick you with that, okay? I'm just trying to get the medication. Is it appropriate or not? Now, very widespread. Impetigo, you may want to do a course of oral antibiotics. Again, things that will cover um, <laughs> staff, staff warriors or group A strep. Sorry, I had a little seizure or uh, <laughs> stroke <laughs> <moment> there. <laughs> okay, if it's just not responding to anything, then you're going to want to refer on to a, a dermatologist. Okay, folliculitis. We talked about this a little bit. This is infection, inflammation of the hair follicle. So down at the base of that hair follicle, you're going to have redness, um, plus or minus a, a little pustule. This occurs up in the upper part of the hair follicle, okay, kind of at the where the skin is. Every now and then, it can start to get deeper. And when we have that, that's called psychosis. Um, not the crazy psychosis, but the... <clears throat> and again, there are different <coughs> organisms, things that can cause this folliculitis or inflammation. Again, number one is bacteria. Staph or strep, mainly staph. But sometimes you can get that fungus or yeast, like we talked about, the malassezia slash pitivorsporum. Um, sometimes mites. Demodex, have you ever heard of? Yeah. Demodex mites is normal on our skin, especially in people that have more inflammatory rosacea. Oftentimes, uh, uh, demodex mites might maybe playing a role there. Again, maybe pyritic, that's going to be more if it's, if it's due to that overgrowth growth of yeast. People usually don't complain about this too much. It may be slightly tender. They just don't like the looks of it, and they're wondering what's going on. Again, same old, same old predisposing factors. Sometimes, though, with folliculitis, it can be areas where we're shaving. Now, sometimes that inflammation can become more great, more inflamed, and then it can progress into what we call a furuncle or an abscess, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. All right, so this is what folliculitis looks like. Folliculocentric. See that one right there? Right there. See that hair coming straight out of it? That tells you that that is folliculocentric. That has to do with that hair follicle, follicle, and that's what you want to be looking for. Sometimes you can have pustules that are not folliculocentric. All right? It could be um, HSV or uh, varicella zoster. So you want to see if it's having to do with the hair follicle and look for those little hair follicles 
coming out of uh, those pustules. You see it a lot on the tush, especially babies that wear diapers, armpits. Again, with this one, she's starting to get um, quite a bit of more inflammation, um, you know, more redness and swelling. Uh, what are what causes this or what bacteria cause this? Staph aureus is number one. Staph aureus. Staph likes to make pustules, abscesses. So when you see abscesses, always think of staph. All right. Can be methicillin sensitive, MSSA, or it can be MRSA, methicillin resistant. The only way you're going to know is to obtain a culture of that. All right. And that has to do more when you've got an abscess. Uh, folliculitis, every now and then, um, if it's extra severe, extra persistent, I will sometimes um, open up some of the tiny little pustules and get a, a culture swab just to see if it is more staph methicillin resistant versus methicillin sensitive. But again, with the methicillin resistant, you tend to, they tend to be angrier and bigger and forming uh, bigger abscesses. <coughs> All right, uh, that's pretty much what I just talked about. You can, skin scraping on the face, if you've got, you can scrape that and sometimes see the demodex mite. Or the spaghetti and meatballs for the pity reform. Yummy breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so folliculitis treatment, again, assuming it's bacteria. Um, you know, mild, you can use antibacterial washes. I recommend that they use this, you know, every day or at least several times a week to the affected areas. Uh, topical antibiotics, such as topical erythromycin or clindamycin. Sometimes just that they can use intermittently, like the kiddos with, with this in the diaper area on their buttocks. It kind of comes and goes, so I'll say, just uh, have this clindamycin lotion handy, put it on a couple times a day for you know a week or so when it's active, and then you can back off of it when it flares up again, start treating it again. And then preventative, you can use an antibacterial wash. If it's more, and again, this is where I was, don't know what I was thinking. In one, in the upper section, I said 10 to 15 days. In the lower section, I said 7 to 10. So, you know, 10 days is about what I'll treat this. Anywhere from 7 to, to 14 days. Now, there is a different bacteria, Pseudomonas, that will cause hot tub folliculitis. Right, anybody heard of that? Good. Have you experienced it? You, you shot that hand up. What? You have? You've experienced it? My husband it. got it. Every time. But My husband got it. Your husband got it? Yeah. This is where a person will get into a hot tub or some kind of a water environment that has an overgrowth of bacteria and it will infect temporarily get those hair follicles inflamed. Primarily where you've been submerged and underneath like the, the bathing suit area. Now this will go away on its own, given time, given about a week or two. Um, so you can just reassure them and say, you know what, this is going to go away. Explain to them what happened. Um, when you get temperatures like, that are higher, like in hot tubs, it, it breaks down those chemicals that keep the bacteria down faster um, and then it allows bacteria to grow easier so um, now you can for more severe cases or a person just flipping out um, you can use some oral Cipro for about a week if you need to. And again, so this is not going to be in your typical folliculitis areas, you know, your the armpits, the chest, the back. It's going to be in an odd pattern um, and a lot underneath the bathing suit. And you're going to ask, well, have you been in a, 
in a hot tub lately or any water source, hot water. Okay, so a furuncle or a boil. All right, this is sometimes folliculitis can get more inflammation and turn into a boil. A fancy word for a boil is a furuncle. Okay? <laughs> so this is more deep seated, more inflammation around that hair follicle. More extensive with in diabetics, but most of the time people are stone cold healthy. Again, staph aureus, staph aureus, staph aureus. All right, this can be MSSA or MRSA. Again, the MRSA tends to do this more, so I meaning tends to get more of these boils and abscesses. Um, so if if you've got uh, folliculitis but they have a lot more inflammation, they've got some boils along with it, then I would probably be wanting to determine is it regular staph or is it MRSA. And by doing that we would unroof a number of those little pustules uh, and get a, a bacterial culture. Does that make sense? <clears throat> so with these, these are going to be bigger than your run-of-the-mill folliculitis more firm, tender, they're going to be uncomfortable. And they're going to be bigger up to one to two centimeters. <coughs> now sometimes they will become fluctuant. We've heard that term where it feels kind of mushy. Obviously has, has pus underneath there. And that is when we call it an abscess. Sometimes there's an overlying pustule. Sometimes there's not. Sometimes you can have some outlying redness or cellulitis that may surround, extend out there. And you can have one or you can have multiple lesions. And there is a furuncle or a boil. What's the best thing you can do for that one there on screen right? Pop it. Oh, yes. We're going to IND that. <laughs> That's a better term than pop it. Mm -hmm. Pimple popper, I know. I would. I had so many people asking me if I watched the pimple popper. I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I could live the rest of my life without watching that. <laughs> All right, but yes, when you have an obvious um, large pustule with probable more um, pus underneath <coughs> it, the best thing you can do is to IND that, incise and drain that. Um, poking just a larger bore needle, like an 18 gauge, into there. Uh, and they're not really going to feel that unless if you really poke it down there. But, you know, they're not going to feel that. And then you can express that junk out. And that will make it feel a lot better and it will go away. Okay, a carbuncle. Okay, furuncle, carbuncle. This is a like a furuncle on steroids, okay? <laughs> this is a grouping of furuncles in the same little group, all right? So you have multiple little openings and pustules within the same large lesion. Back of the neck, the back, thighs are common areas where we'll get this. So you think this is gonna hurt a little bit? Mm -hmm. You betcha. Really red, angry, hard, unless it fits, you know, become more fluctuant. Draining, possibly, around multiple hair follicles. Very painful. You can get some systemic symptoms, such as fever and just feeling kind of puny. And because this is bigger, this can result in scarring. And there you have it. Or 9, 10 in the morning. So you can see those multiple little hair follicles that are involved. Abscess is the term when we have obvious pus, a collection of pus under the skin. And usually it's going to be because you've got some 
decrease in that integrity of the skin. It can happen where you've had trauma, foreign body, burns, things like that. You always, always, always have to think of uh, MRSA. said all that. Alright, for any of these um, with, the, with the fur uncle, carbuncle, and abscess, if it's not, or not really abscess, abscess, if, if there's obvious pus in there, it's fluctuant, that is ready to go and you need to IND it. Okay, if you've got one that's not ripe yet, and I use that term, it's just hard and red and angry, Getting some warm, moist heat on that will help ripen it. It will help it turn into an abscess so that then you can drain it and get that pus out of there and make them feel much, much, much better. I mean, they get like almost immediate relief when, when you drain that because there's a lot of pressure in there. You know, it just, ugh. All right, so simple incision, 11 blade, that's the pointy blade. Um, or a larger bore. It depends upon how big of an abscess. You know, if it's a pretty good sized abscess, you don't want to put one tiny little hole in it. You want to make a, a pretty decent opening. Um, oftentimes, you're going to get some. Uh, hemostats and kind of <laughs> open them up and open up those, you know, little pockets so that you can get all that out. learned I'm like I'm 52 and I'm like turning into my mother <laughs> uh, I, the words I just I could and I could have to introduce my mom right now and I wouldn't be able to remember her name I'm horrible like that horrible, horrible. I've always been like that um, oftentimes when you have a large opening under the skin you drain that abscess and there's just this open pocket you certainly do not ever, ever, ever want to suture that back together because it will become infected again. What you want to do is encourage that to, to continue to drain and heal from the inside out. Okay? And one way you can do that, we kind of talked about that with the Bartholin gland cyst and, and um, they use that... Um, that little balloon thing. Typically on this you're not going to use a balloon, but you may pack this gauze. It's like these thin strips of gauze that um, sometimes are impregnated with an uh, antibiotic iodoform gauze. You will pack that into there. It doesn't have to be real, real, real tight, but enough to where it's not going to close up on top, you know, and then you have this packet and you leave a little strip out hanging outside and you cut it. Um, and that keeps that open. Sometimes, I've heard both, sometimes you can have the patient pull out a little, you know, a couple of inches each day and trim it down, or more commonly, they will come in every day for removal of that and repacking until it's small enough that you can put packing. All right, so talks about MRSA versus methicillin sensitive um, and the, the antibiotics. I, again, with MRSA, I, clindamycin I probably wouldn't do because they're finding so much more resistance with clindamycin nowadays. Probably my first choice is either doxycycline or minocycline. Uh, Trimsulfa or Bactrim is fantastic for it. But I am a little bit nervous to willy-nilly prescribe Bactrim because you can have some deadly um, reactions to, to Bactrim, which we'll talk about in another lecture. <laughs> so I, I used to prescribe it a lot, um, like it was candy, and then you hear, it never happened to me, thank you Jesus, as, as a provider, but it has happened to my supervising physician, and she was like, ever since then, I have been leery to prescribe that. Now, if you have a person that has positive culture 
for MRSA. Okay, they had an abscess or multiple abscesses that you drained and it came back positive. They're, they're, they may very off and on have problems with frequent abscesses um, or folliculitis and, and things like that. They're not going to get rid of that, that bacteria. It's become colonized on their skin. I probably have MRSA on my skin. Um, <clears throat> So what I will oftentimes do is I will recommend that they, you know, up in your nose is where you, that bacteria lives. Nose and body creases. So I will have them swab an antibacteria ointment, such as Bacterban, up in their nasal area twice a day for one week out of every month. If they happen to have, and then I will also do body creases, it, where they tend to have problems, okay? So, say for instance, I had a runner who always had abscesses, fur uncles on her tush. Um, for her, I would probably say, let's do your nose twice a day, one week out of every month, and let's also do the, the gluteal cleft, as well as the leg creases, twice a day um, for one week out of every month. If they tend to have have it up here, I will say, you know, treat the underarms as well as the nose. Does that make sense? Okay, and this is just kind of showing you an I and D. You're going to anesthetize the top of the skin, trying not to put the needle too deep to where you are injecting it into that cavity because it will spray on you more than likely. <laughs> So, and it's impossible, it is impossible to get this entire area numb. It, it's impossible. They are going to be uncomfortable and they're going to hate you for a little bit. But they're going to love you after it's all done. Okay, so after you get it numb at the top and, you know, kind of to the sides, then you're going to get that 11 blade, that pointy blade, poke that in through, and you'll be able to feel when it's through the skin and into that pocket. And with one that large, I would probably, you know, do an inch um, opening <clears throat> and then just external pressure, squeezing all that junk out. You may then um, kind of swab the area just to, again, with that or try to, with your hemostats, open that area up. Again, they're going to hate your guts. Um, and then that is an example of the iota form. Here's some pictures, and that is not, that is no lie of what's, of what's coming out of there. It will gush. All right, now I don't know if I want to take the time for this. This is uh, a YouTube of, like a pimple plopper, um, of an IND of an abscess. I would suggest that you at least at home maybe watch that. Uh, for future reference, uh, it's not going to be on your test or anything as far as the clips from this, but um, more than likely you're going to run into the need to IND an abscess. So I think you would like that. Oh, All right, so again, this just talks about how the, the depth of these infections, impetigo is, is very superficial, folliculitis is down you know, the top part of the hair follicle, erysipelas, which we're going to talk about, is even deeper into the dermis. Cellulitis is even deeper down into the lower part of the dermis and the subcutaneous fat. And then necrotizing fasciitis is way down there. Okay? Same sort of thing. All right, so cellulitis is an infection of the dermis and the subcutaneous tissue. Everybody okay? Do we need a break? If you need to. Uh, usually caused by staph or group A strep. You're going to see this a lot, probably, especially on those lower extremities, people who have um, uh, <laughs> um, chronic venous insufficiency and they they tend to get a lot of uh, 
eczema changes and overgrowth of, of uh, or yeast, not yeast, but um, fungal infections, that's where you're going to see this a lot. It's just prone to that, for that bacteria to, to get in. You have the compromised skin. Acute onset of localized redness, firmness, induration, and tenderness. And it will spread out pretty quickly. Borders may be ill-defined. This kind of differentiates it from erysipelas, which is what we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And you may have some changes up on the superficial part of the affected skin. You may get some blistering. You may get some, you know, if there's been a blister there and it's popped and there is a superficial erosion um, and, and crusting. You may have swollen lymph nodes to the associated area where it will drain. If it's bad enough, you may get some systemic symptoms of fever, chills, fill, and puny. These are examples of cellulitis. See, that's, look on the hand. And that's where you can't really tell, I mean, if we got real close, you could probably define, put a pen around where, a pen marking where that starts, the redness starts and stops. But it's not a boom, here it is, you know what I mean? And there you've got a large bulla associated with that cellulitis. And it looks like some crusting nastiness. That's pretty textbook. Again, typically you're going to, swabbing, getting cultures of this is really kind of hard because this is happening more superficially. Um, and you know, if you just swab that skin, you're going to get the normal bacteria that's on the skin anyway. So, if, unless if I've got something that's draining, I probably am not going to waste the money by culturing that, swabbing that. Um, I'm just going to treat it for what it is, what I think it is. Again, if you've got an open wound that's draining, then you might consider throwing a a swab in there to, for culture. Um, this is hard to see. If you need this, um, there is a, in one of the books that's on access medicine is in there. It just talks about um, the good first choice of drug for these various bacterial things that we're going to be talking about. Cellulitis, ear syphilis. All right, ear syphilis. Boom, boom, boom. This is, instead of kind of could be either or, this is almost exclusively group A strep. Okay, I know I have had this on at least one of my uh, certification exams. So you have to know that. Local redness, swelling. Okay, what kind of defines this, again, this is deeper in the skin. So there's going to be even more swelling and inflammation than in cellulitis. When you've got more swelling and inflammation in a localized area, it tends to cause the skin surface to look like the, the, the skin of an orange. Code d'orange, however you, I'm not French. <laughs> the orange. <laughs> You need to know that too. So whenever you see that code de orange, um, think of erysipelas. <laughs> Obviously, they're not French. I don't know. <laughs> Even my daughter, she's like, Mom, sometimes you sound so hickish. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> All right, so this tends to be very bright red, very well defined, has that real rough texture again because there's just so much inflammation in that skin again that that inflammation goes deeper into the into the dermis again with this you could have some uh, systemic symptoms associated legs and face are the most common I'll let you read through okay so See the difference in this erysipelas on this leg versus that um, cellulitis? It's much more red 
much more well defined. If we got a good look at that, it would probably look, it's almost like a tight, a tight look, you know what I mean? When there's just so much swelling and the on the face, that's just very well demarcated, very red, very angry. Okay. Questions about bacteria? No? 